Hello, everyone. Professor. Yes. Did you get my message that I was having technical difficulties with um, practicing the midterm? Yes, I'm, I'm working on that now. I'm trying to find out what the problem is. Uh, it's, did anybody, while we're here, this would be the best way to ask it. Does anybody not have a problem with it? Did anybody actually get to take it and, and not have any problems? Because it's two different scenarios, depending on that. It, it doesn't really agree with my browser, so. Yeah, okay. And that was what, Reese talking? Uh, Colby. Uh, Colby. Okay. Well, the Respondus is its own browser. Yeah, you have to download Respondus browser. That's that's the reason why we were uh, why I had you do that beforehand is so you could download everything you needed. You can't run your browser in doing it, and when you click on it, it's automatically summons your uh, the Respondus lockdown browser to run it. Yeah, I I downloaded it previously for other classes, and it I uh, still tried to take the uh, Respondus. Mm -hmm quiz test right it didn't work for me though did okay. you get my email professor yeah i did i saw yours i saw uh, a text message from david mccaleb and also uh david parsons i believe i actually had three or four people that's what i, I just need to know did anybody successfully get it to work chase did you get it to work were you able to take the practice respond to this practice test? No, I wasn't. You was not. How about uh, well, we're not? I should say How about Christian or Hector or David McCaleb. No, David already told me that. Caleb. I, I wasn't. I wasn't able to give it to work, and I I had an email conversation with you last night about it. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, so it. It looks like no one actually got it to work. So maybe it is something on our side. So I've got to, I've got to check that out. Uh, the other thing what we need to find out is it might be something where you contact TCC help desk. So that's uh, TCC help at uh, TCC, or I think it's help desk at tcc.edu. Uh, I'm going to try to look and see if there's anything on my side that needs to be fixed. And if there so, is, address that. I, I ended up, I called them last night. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know it was last minute, but I called them. I talked to them. They said, look on the respondus end and the mm -hmm. professor's end. And I went into the respondus menu and under their help thing. And I read through their wiki on that same error code where it was saying um, um, the naming scheme requires a webcam and then also the uh, name of the class. And uh, the arrows, I also got said that it didn't recognize the class too or the course. Gotcha. Okay, so yeah, I will see what I can do. What I, what my intent is, is I'm going to try to see what I have to do to fix it. And then I'll open it back up and give it to everybody at least till Saturday night at 1159. So I'm doing that across the board with all my classes. So hopefully uh, that'll work. But y'all can again text me or email me if you have any problems, but it should it, it should probably be fixed within an hour after this class. Uh, hopefully, so. I, my audio is not dragging like his was just now. I know my computer is trying to uh, do some Zoom work in the background, but it's like converting. So I wouldn't have thinking that thought that took very much bandwidth. So clearly, and it uh, is. professor, what did you so want us to do about kind of uh, the lab? So the lab was today. We were supposed to have a lab at what, like a uh, uh, or something like that. Uh, what I did was I've given you that time off and you can do whatever you want. You could use it to prep for your midterm or whatever. Uh, but later on in the semester, you're going to do on your own. Of course, you can still interact with other students to get help and you can interact with me to get help. And I'm going to introduce it to it to the lab as well. But in that case, you're going to do a lab that's uh, it's basically that linear momentum problem that I hinted at where you take two pucks and slide them towards each other and they leave little dots and then it spreads off and you can calculate whether momentum is conserved before and after. Well, that problem, that that lab is something I, I can run with equipment that I have access to. We, it's not our equipment. I want to buy it, but I haven't bought it yet. It's like four grand a piece. Uh, but I, I'm going to borrow a friend's uh, at another campus and at another school and run that, give you the data, and uh, actually, 
uh, even take pictures of us measuring the little distances between the dots with, with veneer calipers and you read the veneer calipers. And then from that, you're gonna do a full error analysis as well as the analysis itself. So it's gonna be that propagation of error stuff applied. It's not gonna be about deriving formulas, it's about using the formula and that's it. So we'll, uh, we'll do that. And that should take you at least two and a half hours, but maybe up to five or even six at most. Uh, that's that's generally what a lab is supposed to take uh, every week. <laughs> they expect you to spend you know three hours in lab and then three hours out of lab. Uh, most of ours don't do that uh, because we we try to steer it away from that strictly because you guys are mostly people that are working at the same time as opposed to you know if you're at a university a lot of times people don't have to work the whole time. Uh, but that being said, we're getting some feedback now that UVA and Virginia Tech have started doing that analysis in their labs for their calculus-based physics, which we had been doing in Chapel Hill when I was a grad student. Uh, I suppose certain ones were doing it already at Virginia Tech and UVA, but now I know that they're actually stopping putting our, uh, transferring our labs as they should transfer because of that. So I'm gonna to try to implement that. Uh, but that's what we're doing in lieu of lab is sometime later, I will give you this lab or I'll have to make up another lab if I can't get that done where you're gonna do a full error analysis, write up a lab report and all that good stuff. Does that make sense? Uh, so what, what was, what about, uh, what did you want us to do about what was supposed to be today's lab, that nonlinear graphing? So we'll do that next week, but this oh, okay. week, you were supposed to turn in linear graphing too. And now because I uh, did that, the lab was normally supposed to be due at 8.30 this morning, but now it's not due until 11.59 tonight. So if y'all need any last minute changes or uh, corrections or anything, y'all can still do that up until 11.59 tonight. That makes sense? Fantastic. All right, well, that's cool. Hopefully I, uh, that clears that up and, and hopefully I were able to make use of that time in a positive way. Uh, even if it's just sleeping. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to sort of uh, finish up or attempt to finish up, but I'm not actually going to get there. Uh, chapter nine. So we're working on linear momentum. And what I wanted to do is uh, do some typical calculations. Hopefully, hopefully my browser is going to stop being a pain. Looks like I'm the last. So that's always an issue, but uh, it not take too terribly long. So I should be able to get rid of them in time. But uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start by turning on my document cam. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the recoil uh, velocity of an AR-15. So an AR-15 is a, a weapon that, that has been uh, in the news a lot for several years, even decades. Uh, it does not, the AR does not stand for assault rifle, by the way. Uh, it is a powerful weapon in many ways in that it has a pretty high muzzle velocity, but it has a very small caliber bullet in terms of diameter, but it can still be quite, quite massive. Uh, the, the, it's the Remington 223 is the uh, bullet that's fired from it. And uh, that actually has a pretty good load compared to a 22. In other words, it, it has a good amount of explosive capacity for a 22. So that's what makes it sort of lethal. Uh, that combined with the fact that the bullet is actually quite small means that it often goes inside and, and rattles and ricochets around and, and really makes things horrible uh, for, for people that are shot. So that's why it gets some of this negative press. Plus, it's very easy to make it automatic, even though it's you know supposed to be semi-automatic, as you as we saw in the, the terrible case in Las Vegas. But anyways, I thought it'd be neat to, to do a little recoil calculation because one of the big things that us physicists complain about is uh, yeah, we love movies and we love you know people taking liberties with art and stuff like that. That's kind of cool. But one of the things they really, really get wrong is like you know, dirty hairy movies or Arnold Schwarzenegger movies where Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's a big guy. I mean, he's, I think he's close to six foot or he might be slightly over six foot uh, and probably weighs 280. But to be honest with you, that's, you know, that's my weight. Uh, actually a little bit less, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so the neat thing is when he's holding a really big weapon and he fires it, hits someone, that other someone is usually about the same size as him. And what I mean by that is there's not a factor of 10 difference, you know. He doesn't weigh 28 pounds and, and Arnold weighs 280. That would be a factor of 10. But somehow when he or Dirty Harry slash Clint Eastwood shoot someone with this big 50 caliber gun, the person that's hit flies backwards and goes through a wall. Well, conservation momentum says initially the bullet, the gun, and the man are all standing still and the other man standing still. So the initial momentum is zero. Then when you fire the bullet, 
the bullet takes on a certain amount of momentum. And in fact, because the initial momentum was, was zero, the momentum of the rifle or whatever gun you're holding is exactly equal but opposite in direction as the uh, momentum of the bullet. So if that bullet was able to hit someone and throw them through the door, if you're about the same size, you should be thrown the same way. So it's more like uh, imagine strapping yourself to a cannon and you've seen how cannon, really big cannons, especially mortars and stuff like that, you see how they fly backwards even though they got all that weight on them. Now, if you attach something like that to your body, then that would throw you backwards. But when that shell hit the person, it would throw them backwards too. So that's that's sort of the big deal. So I just thought I'd take a nice little calculation of the AR-15 recoil velocity and basically show you that application of conservation of momentum. So here's example one. This is example one. The AR-15 uh, has a mass of, it's actually about 6.55 pounds, so that turns out to be about 2.97 kilograms, so that's its mass. Uh, it fires a 0 0.223, which everybody just calls it a 223 Remington. And I think the most impressive thing about the gun when you fire it is, is the, the loudness of it. It's really got a distinct uh, loud pop to it. Uh, it doesn't have a huge amount of kick, but it's, it's got a significant amount of kick. Uh, the big thing is this bullet can range from 2.27 to 5.8 grams, basically. But the common one would be uh, about 3.56 grams. That's the 58 grain one. But I'm using grams here because that's something that we use in physics. And its muzzle velocity is actually equal to about 993 meters per second. So that's a pretty significant speed, you know, three times the speed of sound, that sort of thing. Uh, pretty big deal, right? So what we have is P initial is equal to P final. That's our fundamental idea. And we're really imagining in this scenario, like the rifle is something like this, say, and that it's suspended on more or less frictionless wheels so that it can roll backwards. Uh, that's what we're imagining, just so we can see how fast this, this rifle will recoil, okay? Since right now, the rifle and the bullet are all sitting perfectly still, that means P initial is just equal to zero. However, after the fact, we get P final is equal to the mass of the AR, times the velocity of recoil plus the mass of the bullet times the muzzle velocity. But that's all got to equal zero because it's equal to P initial. So what we can see is that the velocity of recoil is actually equal to the negative of the mass of the bullet times the velocity of the muzzle divided by the mass of the AR. So we're going to get, in other words, if I treat the rifle as if the, the bullet is firing to the right, then that would be a positive velocity. So I would say, okay, we've got three or 0 0.00356 kilograms times 993 meters per second over uh, 2.97 kilograms. You can see the kilograms automatically cancel out and we get a negative 1.1903 meters per second as the final velocity. And 1.19 meters per second is, uh, you know, it's not, it's not teeny, but uh, I mean, it is somewhat small because it's on the order of uh, one. But if you try to put it in, it'd be one point, what I say, 1.19? I'm just going to convert this, for instance, to meters per second real quick. Uh, and convert that to miles per hour. And I'm thinking it's on the order of three miles per hour. Yeah, it's 2.66 miles per hour. Now, imagine something that weighs about six and a half pounds, uh, a bag of sugar, OK? a bag of sugar coming at you at, at three miles per hour, that doesn't feel great, right? If it hits you and you're not expecting it, it's not gonna feel great. 
uh, but it is, you know, a, a recoil, so you'll have a little bit of pain. The big thing is when people fire these guns, you want to make sure you're like not eyeing the end. Like a lot of people uh, that you'll see on YouTube, they'll literally like have their eyeball right here and they're looking down the <laughs> this thing like that and they're holding it in front of their face. That, that's bad. You know, this is a hard metal thing or maybe a graphite thing that weighs like six pounds is getting ready to pop you in the face at three miles per hour. That'll give you a good black eye. Or if you do it properly and have it up against your shoulder, if you have it out in front of your shoulder, that's going to be uh, more painful too, because it's going to come back with that full speed and hit you in the in the front of your deltoid. The better scenario is you cushion your deltoid up against it, and you sort of allow your body to move back just a little bit so that it can absorb the force over a longer distance. So by taking the change in momentum, which is what has to happen to the rifle, and applying that force for a longer duration of time, you actually get a smaller force acting on you. But either way, you can see that uh, that obviously it has a recoil velocity. And this is what, it, what we talk about when we talk about recoil. It's just a conservation of momentum issue. Any questions on that? Again, I'm trying to stay out of the politics of this, but uh, I like to use you know, relevant things in everyday life. Uh, you might try something like that with a mortar and, and see what the recoil velocity of that sucker was and imagine holding that. Then you get that real effect. Of course, you know, when you shoot someone with a shell that's, you know, eight inches in diameter, we're pretty soft compared to metal. So it just blow right through us more likely than uh, than actually kicking us back. Uh, so there's always that other scenario. Now what I want to do is look at a scenario where you actually have what's called a head on collision. So let's do a one dimensional head on elastic collision. Now, uh, this is example two, and it might not feel like an example because I'm not going to use numbers, but that's sort of the beauty of it. I, I, I will solve this problem, and by doing so, you'll have an answer to many, 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 many problems, okay? So what we have with conservation of momentum, and, and by the way, your book has equivalent equations to these, uh, but, and they're labeled, so you can actually use them. Okay, they're like labeled 9.83 and 9.78 or some, some junk like that. But anyways, the main thing is they have them. So first off, if you're imagining a one-dimensional collision, what you imagine here is basically mass A moving with velocity VA, and mass B moving with velocity VB, and that could be directly towards each other or away from each other. Doesn't really matter. You're just gonna call one direction positive and anything going the opposite direction is gonna be negative and that'll all work out. And after the collision, maybe this one would be green say, after the collision, maybe this one's going this way, that would be VA prime, and maybe this one's going this way, and this would be VB prime. So this is before. And this is after. So conservation of momentum says that MAVA plus MBVB, that's the initial momentum. And therefore, conservation of momentum says that has to be equal to MAVA prime plus M. B, V, B prime. I will call that, uh, well, actually your book has that essentially and they call it equation nine, three, okay? So since it's labeled in your book, that's one you can use. You can write it down on your equation sheet, obviously for your final or whatever. Uh, I actually use a different notation. I'm, I'm just going off the top of my head because this is a common physical uh, physics problem that we solve. And, you know, we do this sort of thing all the time and we've learned neat little tricks. And that's what I'm showing you now is a neat little trick. Now, since it's elastic, that means kinetic energy is conserved. So you also have this other expression, one half M sub A V sub A squared plus one half M sub B V sub B squared is equal to one half M sub A V sub A prime squared plus one half M sub B V sub B prime squared. And that's actually equation nine, seven from your book. I, I wrote it down uh, when I was doing this lecture last night. So I wanted to make sure everybody uh, had access uh, to it and knew that it was an equation that was actually covered. 
Uh, now I'm getting ready to stop the process that's slowing down my browser. So I'm, uh, I'm freaking out just a second. Hold on. All right, so I've just stopped accessing it. All right, now now the process that's slowing the process of the computer down should be finished like in five seconds and we'll, we'll be able to run smoothly, hopefully. Now that we have those two, I'm gonna figure out some way to, so, uh, to solve this problem. So what we're assuming is that we know MA, MB, VA, and VB. And what we're wanting to do is calculate VA prime and VB prime. Those are our unknowns. So I'll put little question marks by them to make, make everybody understand what's the unknowns and what's not. Okay, so that's really what we're solving for. You see that we have two unknowns. And of course, when you have two unknowns, you got to have two equations. That's what we got. So we can do this, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation 9-3, and I'm going to make an equivalent version of it by manipulating some things. In other words, we've discovered over time that a nice, neat trick is to group the MA terms. So here's the MA and that's multiplied by VA minus VA prime. And then if we go over to the other side and group the MBs, then the MB on this side will be multiplied by VB prime minus VB. See, the order just differs, that's all. So we're gonna call this equation one and we're gonna make use of that, okay? Now I'm gonna do sort of the same thing with equation nine seven. Uh, notice there's a factor of one half common to all of them. So I can throw that crap away right from the get go. Right. So now I'm going to take M A and this yeah, time. Yes. Uh, why is the for the velocity A, it's V A minus V prime A, and then the other one's V prime B minus V V B. Okay. So notice the M A over here, or excuse me, the M A over here is positive with V A. If I pull the this term over here, it becomes negative. So I get V A minus V A prime. But when I pull this MB over here, the VB is. Oh, uh, okay. Never mind. I see. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it takes a little while to see it, but yeah, that's it. Uh, so the same thing's going to happen with this. I'm going to end up getting VA, uh, VA squared minus VA prime squared is equal to MB times VB prime squared minus VB squared. And that's going to be equation two. Uh, now I'm going to make equation two even better. I'm going to make equation two into this. I'm going to use our technique from uh, factoring to realize that this is VA minus VA prime times VA plus VA prime. And this is MB times VB prime minus VB times VB prime plus VB. And I'll call this equation two prime, meaning it's really sweet, okay? So now I can divide two prime by one. You see what happens when I divide two prime by one, the MAs cancel out, the VA minus VA prime cancels out, and all I'm left with is VA plus VA prime. And the uh, MB cancels out and the VB prime minus VB cancels out. And all I'm left with is VB prime plus VB. That's pretty sweet. But in fact, I can make it even sweeter. Uh, if I choose to do so like this, I can write VA minus VB. Those are both things I know is equal to negative VA minus VB. Both of those are two things I don't know. So that's the, a really big result. And in fact, it's an important enough result that your book went ahead and numbered it because we're going to use it over and over. I'm going to call this equation three. But your book calls it equation nine, eight, essentially. Again, I'm using different notation because I'm just working it out of my head. Uh, but that's essentially the same equation that your book has. So that means you can use it. Okay. So now what we've done is we've gotten an actual result that can help us. So if I know VA and VB, I can, in principle, use this with one of these other equations, whether it be 9.3 or 9.7, to help me figure out uh, really what that is. So that's, that's an example all by itself. And it just gave me a fundamental result that can help me. So the next part is I'm going to uh, apply this in a very special case. And in fact, I'm going to apply it in a case 
where it, we're playing pool. And in playing pool, you know, the balls are all about, uh, are essentially identical. So we're going to do example three now, which is two, two balls of identical mass. Okay. And I'll just have that up here just in case I need this particular equation. I will know where it is. So I've got it laying up here. I can pull it at any point. So this is going to be example three. And it's two pool balls. Uh, in 1D head on elastic collisions. So we're doing the same thing again, only this time we now have MA is equal to MB is equal to just plain M. Okay. So because of that, we now have access to that new equation we just found. I call it equation three. So I'll write that down. Equation three is that VA minus VB is equal to uh, negative VA prime minus VB prime. Okay, that's a result we can make use of. Now what I can also do is I can take my conservation of momentum equation and get rid of all the masses and something nice happens. So conservation of momentum Okay, with the conservation of momentum, I have m v a plus m v b is equal to m v a prime plus m v b prime. Notice I'm I'm using the fact that all the masses are the same, and because of that, I can now say that v a plus v b is equal to v a prime plus v b prime. I'll call this equation four. So that's IV and that's three. So now I think you can see I've got a VA and a VA, a VB, a negative VB and a positive VB. So if I add three and four, if I add three and four, I'm going to get two VA is equal to, now what you see is I have a negative VA prime and a positive VA prime. That means the VA primes are going to cancel out, but I got a negative, negative, positive v, v prime and a positive VP prime, uh, VB prime. So that's VB prime times two, which lo and behold tells me that VB prime, which is one of the things I was looking for, is just equal to VA. That's a really big deal. What that means is when the two balls are coming together, they're sort of going to swap speeds. At least the, the second ball is going to take on the speed of the first ball. Now I can plug this back into any of the equations that I want to. I'm going to choose to plug it into uh, the VA minus VB one right here. Okay. So if I do that, I'll say, uh, let's call this equation five, plug five. into, let's plug five into three. So what I get is VA minus VB is equal to, I'm gonna go ahead and distribute that negative, negative VA prime plus VB prime. I know that VB prime is VA, so I can now say VA minus VB equals negative VA prime plus VB prime is just VA, so I'll put a VA there. So now you can see that the VAs cancel one another out. Bada bing, bada boom. And I ultimately get that VB prime is equal to, or VB, VA prime is equal to negative VB. Let me make sure I did that right. Uh, I'm off by a negative somewhere. What did I do? This is VA minus VB. I did get that right. And this is negative VA prime plus 
VB prime and VB prime was VA. I dropped the negative somewhere. VP prime is equal to VA, so that's VB prime. Negative and negative is positive VP prime, VB prime. That looks right. I got VA. I got, oh, this is VA. This is negative VA prime. That's right. This is negative VB. This is negative VB. And this is VA and this is VA. Uh, that's just sort of giving me, that's not really giving me the same thing. Hold on a second. Uh, let me try something else. I know that VB prime is equal to VA. That works. Uh, instead of plugging it in the conservation momentum equation, or maybe I should plug it into four instead. I'll, I'll plug, because something happened there. I'm not really sure what's going on now. So I'm going to plug five into four and see if that worked because I, I i know what i'm supposed to get and i made a mistake somewhere but what i do know is va plus vb is equal to va prime plus vb prime now if i plug in vp prime is equal to va then that will eliminate the vb prime so i'll get va plus vb equals va prime plus now VB prime is going to become VA. Now I'm getting the same thing. I thought I'd get a negative. So I don't know how I did this before, but somehow I got a negative. Uh, let me check my result real quick in the book and see if... Uh, See if I'm getting the same thing the book got because that would make a, a, a world of difference. I think they did a similar problem. I know they did a problem just like this, but let me see what happened. Uh, I'm looking at the signs because I'm looking at the same problem you're thinking of. Uh -huh. I think yeah, it's uh, VA minus VB equals V prime B minus V prime A. Oh yeah, they got the same sign. Okay, so yeah, they got the same sign. So it, it all worked. I, I was doing it right. I just was, I think I copied on my uh, previous edition, I copied the answer wrong. So yeah, the actual answer is uh, V A prime is just equal to V uh, B. B. Yep. So that's, that's actually right. And I'm going to call that equation six. So what this means is let's draw a, a figure to make sense of it. So let's say we have, I'm going to do a cue ball moving this time. Let's say the cue ball is moving at three meters per second. And it's getting ready to run into uh, a red ball. Okay. And let's say this red ball is actually moving at five meters per second. After the collision, so this is before. After the collision, what we're seeing is that now the cue ball will be moving at five meters per second. And the red ball will be moving at three meters per second. Or alternatively, if you looked at it this way, let's say, uh, Let's say this thing's moving at five meters per second. And this one's moving at zero. According to this, that means that the white ball will now have a velocity of zero, but the red ball will now have a velocity of five. And I think you've all seen that occur before. So all of these results are completely consistent with what we've seen in pool before. You know, how many times have you hit a cue ball, it runs into the eight ball, and then the it stops and the eight ball takes off with about the same speed that you hit it with. So that's basically it. I'm sorry, I think I might have looked at another problem that I was working when I was in the process of solving this, and that's why I kept thinking I was going to get a negative there. Yeah, that's what I did. Uh, in fact, I ended up doing it. Ah, 
Yeah, I looked at another problem. That's what it was. Okay. Any questions on that? All right, so let's look at another example. And this time, let's consider uh, unequal masses, but they're going to head on and uh, have a head on collision, and one of them sitting still initially. And then I'm going to also examine some scenarios to make sense of it. So this one, I really should do another sheet of paper. So I'm going to put it on another sheet of paper just to uh, keep it from being so jumbled and, and messy. So this will be example four. And this time, unequal masses. Elastic head on uh, one at rest. And actually, you can always jump to a reference frame where that's the case. So you're actually not losing any generality by solving it. You just can transfer yourself to a different coordinate system, one that's moving along as uh, the exact same speed of the other one. Say in that problem that we did earlier, uh, I could force this one to become zero or force this one to become zero, either one I wanted. If I wanted to make this one become zero, then I just jump to the reference frame that's moving to the right at five meters per second. So this one thing would all of a sudden be going uh, zero. And this one, of course, would be going, in this case, negative two, which obviously these aren't really going to collide. So I did something kind of stupid there, but anyways. All right, so with this in mind, let's, let's look at what we got. Again, we have a scenario where conservation of momentum is at play, and we have a scenario where conservation of kinetic energy is at play, and we're going to make use of those. So first off, I'm going to write that uh, MAVA plus MBVB is equal to MAVA prime plus MBVB prime but we're going to set mb equal to zero or excuse me vb equal to zero so that gives me the nice neat little response which is just like what we did before i'm going to take ma and get all the ma terms on the same side and that'll be va minus va prime and then on the other side is just going to be mb vb prime so I'm going to call that equation one, and that'll be helpful to us, just like that one was that uh, I found where they basically flip signs, okay? Now I'm also going to take the conservation of kinetic energy, which is, again, this time I'll even go ahead and, and take the step of making the VB equal to zero, and I'm just going to say MA VA squared is equal to one half MA VA prime squared plus one half M b vb prime squared not 12 okay so with this one i can sort of get something similar again i can say m a times v a minus v a prime times v a plus v b uh, v a prime and that's just equal to m b v b prime squared okay and that's going to be equation two. So now I'm going to take equation two and divide it by equation one. And when I do that, you can see what happens on the right hand side. The MA, or excuse me, on the left hand side, MA VA minus VA prime, that's going to disappear. And all I'm going to be left with is VA plus VA prime is equal to whatever happens on the right hand side, that MB is going to cancel out with that MB and one of those VB primes is going to cancel out with that VB prime. So I'm just going to get VB prime. So that's like uh, super helpful. And in fact, what I can do is I can write this like this. I can say, let's eliminate VA prime by saying VA prime is actually just VB prime minus VA. So now I have VA in terms of the thing I don't know, but in terms of also a thing I do know. 
So if I can eliminate all the VA primes, I will have one equation that just has a VB prime in it, and that will allow me to solve it. So this result is going to be called three. So I'm going to take three and I'm going to plug it into one. So I'm going to plug three into one. That's going to be MA VA. Notice I'm going ahead and distributing minus MA, but instead of VA prime, I'm going to write VB prime minus VA and then MB. VB prime. So you see the only unknown here is VB prime. I can go ahead and distribute all this. I get MAVA minus MAVB prime plus MAVA is equal to MBVB prime. I can get all the VB primes on one side by pulling this over here and I'll get M. A plus MB, notice it becomes positive when it gets over there, times VB prime is equal to, I've now taken care of that term and that term, that's going to be equal to MAVA plus MAVA, that's 2MAVA, and lo and behold, we're going to get an answer that looks a little bit like the tension from the Atwood machine. Specifically, we get VB prime is equal to two times MA over MA plus MB times VA. Of course, the difference is the tension formula for the Atwood machine was basically T equals two M1 M2 over M1 plus M2 times G. So we only have one of those factors, but we couldn't have both of them because the units wouldn't work right, right? So we had to have that in that case, but notice it looks just like it's got the two, the one of the M's and the sum of the M's. So that's the velocity of the second ball, the one that was sitting still initially. Now we can use this again, use this result and figure out what the velocity of the first ball was. So uh, after the collision. So now I'm going to say uh, this will be equation. Let's label it four. What the heck? OK, so I'm going to take and plug four into, I think I want to plug it into three. Yes, that's what I'll do. I'll plug it into three. I could plug it into one, but I think plugging it into three might be even better. Yeah. So if I plug it into three, I'm going to say VA prime is equal to VB, which is this, two MA over M A plus M B. That's going to be times V A, but notice I already have a V A over there. So I'm just going to say minus and leave a space because it would be a one here if I just put the V A, but I want to get a common denominator. So I'm going to write this as M A plus M B under M A plus M B. And remember, your fraction bars are just like parentheses as well. So this negative has to be distributed. When you do that, you're going to see that VA prime is actually equal to 2MA minus MA. So that would be uh, MA. And then minus MB. So that's MA minus MB over MA plus MB times VA. So lo and behold, we get another formula from the Atwood machine. The actual acceleration for the Atwood machine is M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2 times G. So again, it's, it's like another formula that you already know. Only this one is a, a, a perfect match, whereas that one was a little bit off by it's missing a factor of M. So that's a... a that's the two results that we get. That's the final velocity when two balls collide head on. And we can consider certain scenarios like uh, that was part A, say. Now what I want to do is part B. I would like to figure out what if. Buzzer. Yes. These two, uh, these two equations, they apply when the masses aren't the same. Yes. Cool. And you're going to see, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this on the positive note because uh, the applications here are pretty big. 
uh, and they could apply to really horrid things. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna examine a scenario and not talk too much about the, the conclusions except in terms of things that we care a little bit less about, maybe bugs or something like that. So what if MA, the one that's moving first, is much, 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 much bigger than MB? Okay, so this is like a Mack truck running into a fly sitting still. Okay, you can obviously imagine other more horrid situations, but again, I don't want uh, to labor that kind of nasty thing. So what I'm going to do is say, uh, let's consider what VB is for, or let's do VA first. So VA prime is going to be the limit. And the way you can deal with this, by the way, is if you want MA much, much greater than MB, then you take the limit as MB over MA approaches zero. Because that just means MA is like infinitely larger than MB, right? And you do that for MA minus MB over MA plus MB times VA. And you see what happens is basically I could multiply through by one over MB, or excuse me, one over MA over one over MA. And obviously this one would just become one. And this will become minus MB over MA. This one would also become one, and this would become plus MB over MA. So you can see what happens is basically these are going to go to zero. So I'm going to get uh, basically just VA. So guess what? A Mack truck's not going to be slowed down when it runs into a fly. What's going to happen to the poor fly, though? Well, what happens to the poor fly is VB prime is equal, again, to the limit as MB over MA approaches zero of, in this case, it's 2MA over MA plus MB. Again, I can multiply this by 1 over MA top and bottom, so it's multiplying by one, in other words, that makes this just two, and that makes this just uh, one plus MB over MA. And also, of course, we still have the term VA in there. So this turns out to be approximately equal to two times VA. So that's that's really bad, right? If you're the fly getting hit by the Mack truck, if your body was tough enough to sustain it without going splat, you would be knocked away at, say, 120 miles per hour if the Mack truck was moving at 60. So that's why that's the danger of being the small Prius or the bicycle or whatever on the road when a car hits you. That's that's what I mean by trying to stay out of the morbidness. But you can see that that's not a good scenario. So. Uh, that's another reason why a lot of us Americans tend to buy heavy vehicles for protection, but, you know, then we become the problem <laughs> also because we are the ones that if we run into someone, then we're uh, doing the horrible thing. So now we're try the other scenario, and that is what if MB is much, much greater than MA? So this is... Uh, you running full speed into a bridge abutment, or you driving a Prius running into a bridge abutment, or you running head on into a park Mack truck. Okay, all those things are horrible. So in the case of VA prime, this is the velocity of uh, the thing that's actually moving after it hit something that was essentially not movable. We're gonna take the limit in this case, as MA over MB approaches zero, again, that's formally what you're doing, but you don't really have to do all that junk. You're just gonna do MA minus MB over MA plus MB times VA. Again, what we wanna do is multiply by one over MB over one over MB again. Uh, this becomes uh, minus one MA over MB. 
and this becomes MA over MB plus one. So you can see in this case, these two go to zero and I get, get just approximately negative VA. So what this says is basically you're going to bounce off this thing going exactly the same speed that you hit it with. So if you're driving at 60 and you run into a bridge abutment, if the car doesn't crinkle properly, it's going to bounce back at 60 miles per hour. That's a, that's a huge collision. And we use that later when we talk about uh, atoms and molecules and ideal gases. When they hit the walls of a container, that's an elastic collision. Therefore, when the speed comes out, let me make sure I did all this right. Yeah, basically when, when you work that out, it turns out it's gonna, it's gonna bounce back at twice, I mean, at, at the same speed it had. Now we do VB prime. Well, VB prime was two MA over MA plus MB. All that of course times VA. Again, we're gonna multiply by one over MB over one over MB. This just becomes, of course, two. And then this just becomes uh, plus one and then MA over MB, which again, we're taking the limit as MA over MB approaches zero. So you can see what happens is basically you get twice VA. Yeah. Is that right? So MB is much, much bigger. I thought I expect that to get zero. What's going on here? Yeah, I really expect that one to be zero. Hold on a second. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, duh. I didn't write this limit here, so I didn't see what was going on. Uh, the limit as MA over MB approaches zero. Oh, okay, yeah. So as MA over MB approaches zero, this doesn't approach one, duh. I was saying this is approaching two, but that's actually approaching zero, so it's actually zero. Sorry about that. I, I should have. I should have been paying closer attention. I just screwed up. So that's that's what you'd expect, right? If you if you run into an immovable object, you do not expect the move, immovable object to move, and and that's that's what that is. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, the the other critter is going to bounce off of it with negative the speed it had. Uh, let me make sure all that works out right. So taking the limit as ma over mb approaches zero, that becomes zero minus one over zero plus one so that's negative va uh that's basically the same thing i got before so yeah that works okay so that's really the uh scenarios that we're dealing with here does anybody have any questions about that all right now i want to show you what time is it we, we started at what 12 30 so we're supposed to run to a 145, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, sir. Just want to make sure. Oh, lost track of time there for a second. All right, so I'm going to put this on the back, and now I'm going to uh, tackle another problem. And basically what we just saw was two extreme situations. And uh, like I said, you should use those to think about, you know, some of the repercussions that happen in, happen in the driving world. Like I said, I don't want to really uh, talk about them specifically so much just because how uh, horrible uh, some of the results are, and it would seem like flippant or you know uncaring of me to, to discuss them. Uh, but that's definitely something you should take into consideration as a, as a human when you're in such a situation, why you'd want to be careful and so on and so forth. But in this case, what we're going to do is now example four. Yes, now example five, excuse me. So let's do example five, and this is going to be something entirely different. What I'm going to do is something called a ballistic pendulum.
So what it is, is you imagine a bullet with a bitty bitty mass fired with a real big velocity, okay? Now it's gonna embed itself in a block that's say hanging from the ceiling, like so, and that block has a big, big mass. So the next step is gonna look like this. So now the bullet has been embedded in there and tumbled a little hole. And the momentum initially PI is just little m big V. The momentum after right here, in other words, is equal to little m plus big M times V uh, block initial. Okay, that's a lower. Uh, so I'm just saying the block initially after the bullets hit it. But ultimately what's going to happen now is that block is going to take that kinetic energy that it just gained and turn that into potential energy by lifting up like this from the ceiling, okay? And the height difference is now going to be H. So in this case, I had kinetic energy was equal to one half M plus M VBI squared. And that's the total energy. And then in this case, I've got E total is equal to U final, which is little M plus big M times H. That makes sense to everyone. So I can start yep. with these two and say uh, little m plus big m times h is equal to one half little m plus big m times VBI squared. That's something I don't know, but I don't care to know. Really, what I'm doing this ballistic pendulum thing for is to determine what the initial or muzzle velocity is of the bullet, okay? So this is a, a, an actual way you can determine the muzzle velocity for any particular bullet for any particular gun, okay? So I've got this, that allows me to solve for VBI and it says, whoa, VBI. <laughs> so that allows me to solve for VBI, which is equal to the square root of, oh, and I left a G out of here, sorry about that. So that's gonna be equal to the square root of two times G times H. That's easy enough, right? We've seen that before, in fact. And the reason why that works so well is because the M's canceled out. So now that I have that, I can say conservation of momentum says PI equals PF. Well, that means M V, the big V in other words, is equal to M plus M times VBI. So now I can conclude that big V. Uh, you're off camera, professor. Thank you. Now I can conclude that big V, the muzzle velocity, is just little M plus big M over little M times the square root of 2GH. So you could, for instance, uh, consider a block of 10 kilograms. Let's try example. I'll, I'll call this example six. Let's try M equals 10.0 kilograms. Little m equals 4.00 grams. So that's a little bit heavier than the uh, 223 Remington I was just working with. And let's say, Let's say uh, V, let's just do the Remington one. Let's say V is actually 993. So instead of us trying to use it to solve V, let's see how far a block like this would actually lift if we shot it with the problem we just shot. Okay, again, I'm, I've taken some liberties. Actually, no, let's don't take liberties. Let's go ahead and work back with the 3.56. I like that. So this is like a follow-up to the first example. 
So what will H be? Well, I can solve for H. I'll square both sides. I'm going to say V squared is equal to M plus M over M squared times 2 times G times H. So H should be equal to uh, M squared V squared over M plus M squared. And then, of course, in the bottom, I have a 2G. So my H, if we really did the, do this, so we're looking at a 22-pound block that we're hitting, uh, we're going to say the actual mass here is 0 0.00356 kilograms squared times 993 meters per second squared over two times 9.80 meters per second every second times uh, 10.00356. As you can tell, that part could be completely ignored for this particular part. And when I do this math, let's see what we get. Point zero zero three five six squared times nine nine three squared divided by parentheses ten point zero zero three five six squared times two times nine point eight. And this gives me a really small number. It gives me six point three seven. one four times 10 to the negative three meters. So it's only gonna lift about 6.37 millimeters. Again, just to give you an idea how big that is, we're talking a 22 pound block that you just shot with an AR-15. The block is only gonna be lifting up about that high. So yeah, if you shoot somebody with an AR-15, obviously that's a, not a scenario that I would imagine any of my students would do. Uh, they're not gonna fly through a wall like you'd see on a movie. That's the main point I was trying to make. Any questions on that one? All right, the last thing I want to bring to your attention is the last section that we're doing in chapter nine, which is on center of mass. Cause it turns out when, when you solve conservation momentum problems, you can solve them with conservation momentum, but sometimes uh, conservation momentum, it means the net force is equal to zero. And if the net force on the system is equal to zero, that means the center of mass of the system will not move, or at least it will not accelerate, right? It's gonna be obeying Newton's first law of motion an object in motion tends to stay in that state of motion unless acted upon by a net external force or Galileo's law of inertia, which says that an object in motion tends to stay in that state of motion uh, as if it has some inertia, some reluctance to accelerate, right? So both of those things are real. So it turns out when you uh, are solving a problem that you can solve with conservation momentum, sometimes you can solve it with a center of mass uh, problem as well. In other words, the center of mass either won't move if it's not moving initially, or it's gonna move constantly at the same rate. So if you look on my YouTube channel, you'll see uh, two problems with a train car. And it's a train car loaded up with a with a with uh, basically a cannon, a very heavy cannon, a very heavy train car, and then a bunch of cannonballs. And we're gonna shoot the cannonballs from one end of the train car, it's gonna and hit the other end of the train car. When you first shoot it, of course, the train car and the uh, actual cannon are going to recoil backwards but then when the cannonball hits the other side it's going to recoil forward and then we're ideally imagining the ball will fall straight down there and they're really like some kind of gutter system so all the balls end up right there and you shoot a series of them boom 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 and i ask you well how far will the uh actual train car have moved at the end of the, that experiment and i calculate it once with calculate uh, conservation of momentum and then i calculate it again with uh center of mass and both of them give me the exact same answer. So it's a really cool problem. I definitely recommend you looking at it. It's a, it's a nice, neat learning experience. So let's uh, get started with center of mass. So if you think of center of mass, 
then you should think of the place where you can hold something up with like one finger. So like if I wanted to find the center of mass of this pin, I put my finger at a particular spot where I think just as much mass is on one end as is on the other. Now this has got rounded stuff. And there's a little button there that's making it hard for me to balance. And I'm old, so I'm probably got the shakes or something crazy. <laughs> but either way, uh, the, the net effect is that the mass distribution, like this piece of mass right here is a certain distance from my finger and puts a certain amount of torque on it, causing it to rotate. Well, that torque should be mass times G, that would give me the force, and then times the lever arm, which would be that distance, which is like in meters, and that's going to tend to pull it this way. Well, if there's another equal mass the same distance away, then that'll pull it this way and it'll balance. So that's what we're looking for is we're looking like mass times G times X, but it turns out when you're trying to figure out the X, you're going to have to get rid of that mass times G to begin with, or else it's going to come out in something other than meters. So you're going to end up dividing by mass times G. So why even multiply by mass in the first place? So let's imagine a scenario where I have a uniform rod. I'm going to turn back so you don't look at the top of my head. <laughs> turn back and look at the problem. And this will be example, what, seven? Example seven. I'm doing it in red for some reason. So imagine like a uniform rod. Like this. And you might say, okay, let's balance it. Let's say it's one meter long. This would be the zero mark. And this would be the hundred centimeter mark. And I know if it's a uniform rod, its center of mass should be right about at the 50 centimeter mark. So I'll hold this up right here at 50. And you might think to yourself, okay, well, what if I come over here to 30, which would say be here, and I hung 10 kilograms there? Well, that would tend to rotate it this way, wouldn't it? if my finger was right here. So I'd want to balance that out. So what if I only had a 20 kilogram mass to hang on it? Where would I hang the 20, the 20 kilogram mass to make sure uh, that it, it, it's balanced again? Can anybody think of that? At 90. At 90? You're, you're yeah, thinking along the right lines, but you got your world a little mixed up. Okay. So you got a 10 that's how far away from this? Um, 20. Right. And then you've got a 20 that's that how far do you want it away from this to make it rotate the same amount? 10. 10. Oh, yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. See, I knew you were yeah. thinking 10. You knew it right, but you just subtracted from the wrong end. So, yeah, here's 60 right here. And then if you hung the 20 kilogram there, now it's going to balance. And the reason why is that 10 kilograms – Technically, times 9.8 would give the Newtons. And then times 20 centimeters would give you the total torque. And in fact, you'd end up getting uh, 1,960 Newtons. Well, over here, you'd get 20 kilograms. Technically, to make it Newtons, you'd have to multiply by 9.8. But now we're going to have to multiply by 10 centimeters. And lo and behold, you're going to get 1,960 newtons times meters or times centimeters again so this is newton centimeters that's the torque so that gives us an idea of what we're going to do to try to find the center of mass we're going to keep products of mass times distance away so now let's imagine for just a second that we're instead trying to find the center of mass and this right here is the x-axis and i'm trying to say the x-axis is right at the zero mark So we think in this case, the center of mass should be 50 if this is the weight distribution, right? So what we'd say is I'm going to guess the center of mass formula, X center of mass, I'm going to take M1 and multiply it by, let's say, X1 plus M2 and multiply it by X2 plus dot, 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 plus MN and multiply it by XN. But of course, that gives me kilograms times centimeters, or if I put G in there, it'd give me newtons times centimeters. 
I don't want that. I want centimeters, right? Because this needs to be the center of mass, which is a unit of meters or centimeters. So I now have to divide it by the most reasonable thing I can, which would be M1 plus M2 plus dot, 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 plus Mn. So that's our guess at what the center of mass might be. I think I've argued that pretty well. So now let's say, all right, let's check and see what the center of mass is. Well, at the 30 centimeter mark, I put 10 kilograms. So I'm gonna say 10 times 30, just leave the units off. Uh, there's actually the mass of the ruler, which if it really is the center of mass, that should be right at 50. So let's say the, the ruler has a mass of 20 kilo, or 25 kilograms. So I'll just say 25 kilograms there. And that's of course at 50. And then I also have at the 60 centimeter mark, I got that 20 kilograms. So I'm gonna put 20 at 60. And then I gotta divide it by all those masses. 10 plus 25 is 35 plus 20 is 55. So when I get this, I get 300, uh, one, two, five, zero, and 1800. And all this will be divided by 55. And that should equal, let's see, 300, assuming my arithmetic was correct. Anybody see any errors in my arithmetic, please let me know. Plus 1250 plus six times two is 18, 1800. And now I'm going to divide that by 55. And Did I do my math right? Let me see. Uh, 30 times 10 plus 25 times 50 plus 20 times 60. Okay, I got a slightly different numerator that time. So that makes me feel a little better. Now I'm gonna divide that by parentheses 10 plus 25 plus 20. There you go, that time I got 50. 0 0.0 centimeters. So that is a good idea for what we're calling our center of mass is you sum up all the individual masses times their distance from some common origin and then divide it by the sum of the masses and you'll get the formula. So XCM for discrete objects is equal to the summation from I equals one to N of M sub I X sub I over M over the summation over I of M sub I. Okay, so that's the XCM. The YCM, of course, would be similarly defined. It'd be the summation from I equals one to N of M sub I, Y sub I, over the summation from I equals one to N of M sub I. Now, if we go to discrete things, uh, if we go to continuous matter, then this becomes XCM is equal to the integral of X dm over the integral dm and ycm becomes the integral of y dm over the integral dm and you can see i've actually got a couple problems like that worked out on my youtube channel that you can check out already but that's the last thing we're going to do is show you how to calculate stuff like that and so i want you to look at i want you to look at the two train car problems and the finding center of mass. I want you to look at those uh, for next time. Now our class time is up and you guys are free to go. Thank you. You're welcome. 
I'll stick around. Like I said, if anybody has any questions. Um, I did have a question, Professor. Yeah, go for it. Go um, uh, did you, I check with the uh, like I was going to reserve my seat for the uh, midterm on Tuesday. Uh huh. Um, I uh, have you have form. you contacted them about that? Yeah, uh, yeah. I have it. I'll send that in so you can just show up. Uh, did they tell you they needed a uh, appointment or anything like that? Um, I reserve my seat. They're, I think they just need like you to to confirm the midterm. I think. Yeah, I just got to. And it's going to be at the, the Chesapeake stuff. campus, correct, sir? Yeah. Which campus are you going to? Uh, Chesapeake. Chesapeake. I actually going to make it available for all the campuses. That way, if you change your mind, you have to be okay. somewhere, be cool. And, and uh, how would it work with me um, bringing in the formula sheet? Uh, uh, do you have? I have a in the form that I fill out. I let them know uh, that you're allowed an equation sheet. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. No problem. And would I need to like send send the equation sheet in to you? Yeah, they're they're supposed to get a copy of it, maybe take a photograph of it and send it to okay. me before you use it. And, and then I'll get it that way. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. See ya. Hey professor. Um hold on just a second. Sorry. I'm gonna talk to my daughter just one second. You're okay. Sorry about that. I'm back now. What were you saying? Yeah, hey, uh, I'm still. Uh, I I understand that like everything's like super chaotic right now coming up with this midterm prep. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, I'm trying to still follow up on test number three. I know we talked a couple classes ago about it. Yeah, this is crazy, um, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I've got a note right here on my uh desk saying to set that, and I meant to do that two days ago, and I haven't done it. So that's test okay. three, right? I'll try yeah, I understand. to do it right after and I'll give you like I said, I'll give you plenty of time to do it. Yeah, I, I understand you're super busy and stuff, and I'm just uh, you know, just trying to follow up. So no I appreciate you. Thank you so much. No problem. Sorry Again. about that. No, you're you're good. I was the one who was late, so you know it's on your time and Thank I understand. You. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. About the respondus test. Um okay. We're gonna change the the date. Yeah, I'm going to date, make it at least uh, do uh, Sunday or Saturday night at 11.59 p.m. Uh, cool. Hopefully I can get it to work first. <laughs> I, I should okay. be able to do that within the next hour, hopefully. And uh, um, the, uh, the formula sheet, is it okay if I send you a picture of what I've got? Yeah, uh, yeah that, that would be fine. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah, just some things, notes, I think, as long as it's got one on it. assigned to it that has like a seven dash eight or something, then that's that equation is fine. Or otherwise, you have to you know use one that I made up for you and told you it was okay. Which I think can is we okay. write notes like certain things you notice in principles wise? No, not supposed to be any sentences. Uh, you can give generic names for the variables, like you can call y a coordinate, or you can call v a speed or velocity, but that's about it. Okay. Yeah, no, no, none of those little helpful hints like this is the velocity at the peak or something like that. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, um, I got a question. Go for it. So for test number three, I took the one that said uh, this is the second corrected one. Um, were we supposed to take the other ones that had like... Let me double check on that. I can't remember which one's right, so I'm going to write down... This is Nathaniel Skirvin. Yeah. Yeah, I'll make sure you took the right one. Uh, if not, I'll open the other one back up. I will have to check if the, if the one that you took was wrong, but it was obviously wrong, then I might, you know, take off points for being late. But I, I, I since I put right. it up there, I doubt I'd do that. Okay. Right. So yeah, I'll I was just there. making sure because I took the one that said uh, the second corrective one when there was like two other ones. And I was thinking... The second one probably was the 
uh, last updated one. So I took yeah, that one. I think that is the right one. And the other ones should have disappeared. So it, more than likely, if, it, if you took the second corrected one, then yeah, you're, you're probably going to be fine. But yeah, I was just asking because uh, it seems like I got a zero for the other ones and it seemed like it brought down my grade quite a bit. <laughs> ah, yeah. So when, when you first make a practice test on Canvas, it automatically assumes it's a test instead of a practice test. So uh, that should actually have no negative effect on your grade whatsoever. That means I've got to go in and sit something. So if your actual course grade changed, that's not a real change. That's a, that's a boo-boo. Okay. That can well, thank help you. you, in other words, the practice test does. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. No problem. Noah, do you have a question? All right. I'm going to call it a day. Have a good one, everybody.